You know, we're in a series of messages entitled uh, uh, "Biblical uh, Marriages of Biblical Proportions. And we've been looking at uh, marriages in the Old Testament. What I want us to do today is I want us to look at the marriage of Ahab and the marriage of Jezebel. Uh, This morning, notes are available. Also, there's a discussion guide on our website, and you can follow it there. You know, we're living at a time where the pandemic is affecting a lot of areas of our lives. We know it's affecting the economy. We know it's affecting the the financial. It's impacting financially marriages. But we also know that it's impacting uh, marriages, families. You know, as people are home, trying to homeschool. uh, Also, as people are out of work. Uh, there's a little bit of pressure in, in the family and in marriages. And I pray that as we're looking at marriage, this would help you and this would encourage you. And this will give you uh, an understanding that you're not alone. God is with you in a very special way. But I, I want to start today, as I talk to you about Ahab and Jezebel, their marriage, I want to start by asking our ladies uh, a question. Now, ladies, I, I really want you to be honest. But here's the question. How many of you maybe occasionally or even often struggle with the need to have things the way you want them. In other words, you can be a little controlling. Amen. Ladies, uh, go ahead, take control of the situation and say, amen. Amen. Thank you for your honesty. Uh, I want to talk to the men. Men, I have a question for you. How, How many of you would say that maybe you're a little bit too easygoing or you're too passive? Guys, would you, uh, passively say, amen, amen. All right. But today we're going to be looking at probably one of the worst marriages in all of the Bible. As a matter of fact, if you feel bad about your marriage, after looking at the the marriage of Ahab and Jezebel, you're going to leave here feeling a a little better about your marriage. But let me give you a little bit of background about Ahab and Jezebel. Ahab was the king of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel. He was the seventh king. We know that he lived about uh, 875 years before Christ. He will reign for 20 years. We know that during his time, he was a very strong political leader. We know he was a very strong military leader. But one of the things that we also know about Ahab is that he led the people of God into idolatry. Under his reign, the people of Israel worshiped more idols than under any other king. The Bible tells us that they worshiped cows and they worshiped Baal. They were involved in a lot of idolatry during his reign. He's married to a lady by the name of Jezebel. The word Jezebel actually means, where is Baal? And under her influence, the Bible tells us that she was instrumental in encouraging Ahab to lead the people into idolatry. The Bible, when it describes Ahab, it's interestingly how it describes him. It says that Ahab did more evil than any other of the kings before him. Look at what it says in First of Kings twenty one twenty five. It says this. It says, No one else so completely sold himself to what was evil in the Lord's sight as Ahab did under the influence of his wife Jezebel. You know, that's an interesting verse, and I, I want you to notice a couple of things. Notice it says, Ahab sold himself. By the way, that's the literal word in the Hebrew. It's the word maher, and it means to give oneself over, to literally sell oneself. But notice, the Bible says he didn't do it alone. The Bible says he was under the influence of his wife Jezebel. That word influence is the the Hebrew word that means enticed by, encouraged by, stirred up by his wife. You know, when you read that, you can't help but, but agree the power of the women in our lives. I want you to know, wives, you're very powerful and very influential in the life of your husband, in the life of your kids, in the life of your family. Now, when we look at Ahab and Jezebel, I I want you to know right off the top, they represent two of the most common problems in marriages today. In other words, what they experienced 2,800 years ago are the same things we're experiencing today. And you say, well, what are those two common things you're talking about? This is what I'm talking about. Ahab represents the passive husband and Jezebel represents the controlling wife. Let me, let me say it again. Ahab was very passive, Jezebel was very controlling. And I want to talk to you about that, how it works in our marriages today, and uh, how it affects our marriages today. But let's start off with Ahab. Ahab, the passive husband. First of all, there's a story there that, that's told about Ahab, and, and the story is that he had a neighbor by the name of Naboth. Naboth had a really nice vineyard. And Ahab saw his neighbor's vineyard, and he thought, you know, that would really be cool if I could own that vineyard for myself. 
So he goes out to Naboth and he says to him, hey, listen, I, I want to buy your vineyard. Notice how it describes it in First of Kings 21, starting with verse 2. One day Ahab said to Naboth, since your vineyard is so convenient, in other words, so close to or nearby my palace, I would like to buy it to use it as a vegetable garden. I will give you a better vineyard in exchange, or if you prefer, I will pay you for it. Now, some of you are thinking, he's king. Doesn't he have the authority of just taking it? I mean, after all, uh, you know, he's in power, he's in control. And the answer to that is absolutely not. He couldn't just go and take it. By the way, in, in that type of, that, at that time, the Canaanite uh, nations, uh, the king was owner of everything. The pagan kings could go and they could seize any property, any personal belongings at their pleasure because all the property was owned by the royal family and it was entrusted to their subjects. But when the king said, I want it back or I want it now, they had to give it up. But that was not the case in Israel. You see, Israel was a little different. He said, well, what was different about Israel? Well, under Israeli, uh, the way they looked at it, God owned all the land. And God proportioned the land. And while God was the owner, the people were the stewards. So if anyone owned the land, it was God. So a, a, an Israeli king did not have the authority to go and just take it. And that's why you're going to read Ahab is going to go to Naboth and he's going to negotiate. He wants to negotiate. I want to buy it from you. I'll trade. I'll pay you whatever price you want. So he begins to negotiate. And look at what it says in verse 3. But Naboth replied, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance that was passed down by my ancestors. In other words, no, I got this from my parents. They got it from, from my grandparents. And I, I have to hand this down to my children. Look at what it says in verse 4. So Ahab went home angry and sullen. By the word, that sullen means disheartened. You know what? Resentful. Little angry. And why is he angry? Because of Naboth's answer. And the king went to bed with his face to the wall, and he refused to eat. Now, I want you to notice, what a big baby, amen? Basically, Ahab doesn't get his way, so he gets his ball, and he goes home. Which, by the way, is the way a lot of men are today. You know, if we don't feel we can be successful, if we don't feel we can win all the time, we just don't want to play. My way or the highway. You're going to do what I want, and if you don't do what I want, you know what, I'm, going to, I'm just going to, you know what, get my ball, get my bat, get my glove. You remember when you were kids, the guys that, they owned the ball, the bat, the glove, you made them mad, you were careful not to make them mad or disagree with them because they'd pick all other stuff and take it home, and you couldn't play ball anymore. And that's the way sometimes in marriage men are. You know, when we feel, ladies, that we're not going to measure up to what you want, you know, if we start believing we're never going to be good enough, I'll never be like your father, I'll never be able to please you, because every time I try, it seems that it doesn't work. So if we don't feel that we can win, we'll often take our ball and go home, and we'll do what Ahab did. We'll go and have a pity party, because that's the way the passive man is. Let me give you a, a couple of characteristics of what passivity looks like in a, in a man. And by the way, men are not, not the only ones. There are women that are passive, but mostly you see it among men. Now, what, what is a passive man? Well, let me give you some characteristics. Number one, they're non-confrontational. They'll do anything to avoid conflict. They don't like fighting. Anything that smacks problems or, or anger or that kind of stuff, you know what, I don't want to do it. The second thing is that they're happy to go with the flow if they don't have a strong opinion on a particular topic. You know what, they, they, they won't speak up. In the, extreme, in the extreme case, they'll get lost among stronger personalities. They will not speak up. They have, you know what, they don't feel they need to. And what you'll see about passive men, because they don't talk passive men, they, they bottle their emotions. They, they sort of stuff their emotions. And then sometimes, uh, the other characteristic, and by the way, there's a whole bunch of them. Sometimes they let people walk all over them, including their wife and their children. You know what, they're, they're pushovers. You know, by the way, let me, let me talk to you ladies about pushovers. You know, uh, controlling wives love passive husbands because they can control them, but they get mad when other people control them. They get mad when at the job, you let them walk all over you. They get mad when at other settings, your, your parents, your siblings, you let them walk all over you. At church, you let people walk all over you. And, and we get mad. I want to walk all over you, but I don't want anybody else. But let me tell you, once you're trained to be passive and allow people to walk all over you, it's going to happen everywhere. Now, you're probably asking yourself, what causes passivity? 
Why do we see this? Well, it's, 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 it's the way you were brought up. It's, it, it comes from your home. It comes from the, the parenting style. It comes from the family dynamics. And other influences. Maybe child abuse, neglect, harsh punishment. But the result of that, all of that, the way you're brought up, there, there is low self-esteem. That's also, you know, probably what's, you know, in, in, in passive people. They have low self-esteem. And, and so many times, people that are passive, they were controlled by mom. They were controlled by dad. And as a result of that, their spirit was broken. By the way, something is terribly wrong, parents. When out of our need to control our kids, we break them. And when you break their spirit, what you have done, in fact, is that you have made them, you know what, not believe in themselves. They're broken. Now, I, I talk to parents all the time, and parents say, well, Pastor, I, I got some wild kids, and, and I have to break them. You know, to, to, I got to whip them into shape. But, but listen, let me suggest to you that there is a difference, parents, between taming your kids and breaking your kids. Yeah, our kids need taming. They need to know how to act in certain situations. Sometimes they need us to come down on them. Sometimes they need correction. Sometimes they need us to straighten out. But there's a difference between training and breaking them. You see, and right now what's happening is that you see a lot of broken men. You know what? They are broken men. They are men's body, but inside is a broken child that was broken by mom and dad. There's a huge difference. And sometimes it's easier just to break them. You know, because we want to control them. And that's why you're going to see, especially among the Latino culture, where you know what? Mom wants to control you guys, even though you're married, even though you're a grandpa. You know, their attitude is you're going to do what I say and you're going to do it when I say it. And you're like, no, you know, you have a hard time saying no to that. But one of the things also that we know about passive men is that they can be silently aggressive. In other words, they don't like conflict. You know what? They let you walk all over them. They don't seem to get mad, but when they do get mad, they blow up. They really blow up. You know, and that's what's going to happen to Ahab. He's, he's like, he, you know, he doesn't know how to express it, so he goes to his room and he cries. And, and notice here comes Jezebel, the controlling wife. Not, notice what she does. You know what? In verse 6, in verse 5, she comes and she says, well, what's the matter? His wife, Jezebel, asked him. What made you so upset that you're not eating? You're always hungry. You're always eating. Why are you not eating now? Look at verse 6. I, I, I asked Naboth, this is Ahab, I asked Naboth to sell me his vineyard or trade it, but he refused. Ahab told her. In other words, I wanted a vegetable garden, and Naboth said, no dice. By the way, guys, if you're into vegetable gardening, don't feel bad. So was Ahab. Amen. It's not just a woman thing. It's a guy thing too. Amen. Notice verse 7. And notice what she says to him. Notice what she does. Are you the king of Israel or not? Jezebel demanded. Get up and eat something and don't worry about it. I'll get you Naboth's vineyard. In other words, she says, hey, you're the king. Is this how the king behaves? You big old whiner, you loser, you big baby. In so many words, she was very disrespectful toward him. She goes, I want you to get out of the bed and I want you to go and eat. And I'm going to take care of this vineyard situation and this Naboth situation for you. In other words, you can't do it. I'll do it for you. And Jezebel is large and in charge and controlling people. That's the way they are, large and in charge. And I got this. Guys, I need a big amen from you guys about this point. Amen. <laughs> ladies are looking at me cross-eyed. Amen. <laughs> Listen, ladies, here's the truth of the matter. A lot of us men, we can be very insecure at some time or another in our lives. As a matter of fact, what I've learned, the stronger that we portray ourselves as men, you know what we're really trying to do is hide the insecurities that we have inside. You know, men have a lot of insecurities. So do women, but I'm talking to men right now. And those insecurities, you know what, sometimes they affect our, 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 our self-esteem. Sometimes, uh, uh, you know, it just, it's just the way we are. And I'll tell you what I've learned. Women, when you realize how insecure your husband is, sometimes we lose a little respect for our husbands. Sometimes we think, well, this is not who I thought he was. And it causes us to look down on them and belittle them. And it causes us to sort of convince ourselves, well, if our family is going to go anywhere, I need to take charge. I need to be in control. If, it, if I don't do it, it's not going to get done. 
And a struggle begins. By the way, this control and passivity, what it leads to is a power struggle in marriage. Who's in charge? Who's in control? Who makes the decision? Who has the last word? Who decides? Who's the final authority? And there's this battle going on. Now, this is not a new battle. It goes back, Ahab. But you know what? It goes way back to the Garden of Eden. You know, when you look in the Garden of Eden, the Bible says God created everything. And if you paid attention, everything was good. You know, the animals was good, the plants was good, nature was good, everything's good. But after he made man, God said, it's not good. Not that he made man, but he said, it's not good that man would be by himself, be alone. You see, man, God says, doesn't do very well by himself. That's why, ladies, we lose our keys, we don't bathe regularly, we don't like brushing our teeth regularly. You know what, by ourselves, we're a mess. So God says, Adam, you're a mess and you're not going to do good by yourself. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring a woman to you. I'm going to bring you a helpmate. I'm going to bring you someone that can help you be all that you need to be. Now here's here right away, some women get insulted and they say, I don't want to be a helpmate. I want to be an equal. You know what? We all have equal value. You know what? We're all the same before God. And by the way, that's not what God is. God is not saying that you're less. God is not saying that man is better. God is not saying that that you don't have the ability to lead. That's not saying that. So women, when we read this, sometimes women say, well, I want to be in charge. I want to be in control. And yet God says, listen, honey, listen, wives. It's necessary, you are necessary in your husband's life to help him become all I want him to be. Because he cannot be all he needs to be without your help. You are vital. You are important. Of course, uh, the wife says, well, what about me? Well, what God says is, when you fulfill that, your role and your responsibility, all his successes become your successes. All he becomes is who you become. And I think that's part of the problem. Sometimes, guys, we we have success and we do well, and we don't realize we are who we are because of the great women that help us, that are there, that, you know what, uh, speak into our lives. And sometimes we want to take credit for everything that's accomplished. You know what? And our wives begin to feel a little bit left out. And what's even worse, when we move up to the top because they help us, we abandon them, and we go find someone better, younger, whatever. So women are a little bit, hey, I, I don't feel very comfortable with this. What about me? But guys, our success is our wife's, it's our family's success. Why? We're a team. But here's what God is saying, ladies. Here's the key. God says, you can take a man who is weak and you can help him become a strong man of God. That was the assignment of Eve with Adam. Help him out. You see, that's what a godly woman will do. A godly woman will take a weak man who's not good by himself and make him stronger and make him better. But I'll tell you what a controlling woman does. She'll take a weak man and she'll make him weaker. Let me say that again. She'll take a weak man and make him weaker. And that's exactly what Jezebel will do in the life of her husband, King Ahab. She's going to make him weaker. And you say, well, how, how does she do that? She does it by doing two things. And by the way, those are the two things that today... Ladies, if you're not careful, you're going to do them in your marriage toward your husband and you're going to make him weaker than what you already perceive that he is. Now you say, well, what did she do? What are those two things? Well, here's the first one. She belittles him with her words. She's critical of him. Notice verse seven. Is this how you act as king over Israel? In other words, what kind of man are you? What kind of husband are you? What kind of leader are you? You know, ladies, what, what, what you say about your husband is either building him up or tearing him down. Let me go as far as saying what you are telling him is what he is becoming. Tell him he's a loser. He's becoming a loser. He's no good for nothing. He's becoming a no good for nothing. You're telling him he's a terrible husband. He'll become a terrible husband. Because what you speak into him, what you say about him is what he becomes. You know, we've been telling you that a lot over there in Proverbs 18, 21. It says the power of life or death is in our words. And sadly, so often the controlling wife, to continue to control him, she'll tear down her husband over and over again with belittling, critical words. Never can do anything right. And you say, well, why, why, would a, why would a controlling person do that? Well, what's, what's in it for them? Why? Why would somebody want to tear somebody down so much that you can control, and then after it's done, you don't respect him because in your eyes, he's not man enough. Why does that happen? 
What, what's the thinking behind that? Well, first of all, let me, let me give you a why, why controlling people are the way they are or what are characteristics of controlling or critical persons. Number one, what they will do is that they'll guilt you into constant monitoring. Now, what does that mean? They want to know everything you're doing. They'll ask you about everything. And if you don't tell them, they'll say, what do you have to hide? What's going on? And you're like, you know, honey, if I tell you everything that's going on, it'll take you all day. There's a lot going on. But you know what the truth of the matter? They're monitoring you because they want to control you. It is a control technique that is used by cults, by very controlling groups, controlling people, including wives. Here's the second characteristics. They'll isolate you from friends and family. In other words, they don't want you hanging out with anybody because you're gonna get in, you'll be getting other inputs, other influences. And the only influence they want in your life is theirs. And the only thing they want you to listen is you're going to do what I say because I want to control you. And then the third characteristic is they're paranoid about and they doubt your motives. They don't trust you. You know what? In controlling relationships, there is an absence of trust. And that trust may come because of you have shown you can't be trusted or past experiences in their lives of how, you know what, people did them wrong. And now they're, I'm not going to let that happen again. I'm in charge. I'm in control. And then the fourth thing is that people that are controlling, they need to be constantly reassured. In other words, they suffer from serious insecurities also. They have very low self-esteem. They want to know that they're the most important thing in your life and you have nothing else. And by the way, I agree with that. Except God needs to be number one, spouse should be number two. But that doesn't mean we don't have any under interests. Of course we do. We have children, we have careers, we have parents. You know what, we have, we have a lot of stuff. But a controlling person, you know what? All they want is you to reassure them. It's about them. And then lastly, they want to be your keeper. In other words, the controller puts himself in the position of, I'm going to protect you. And if it's not for me, you will make a mess. You're, you're going to get in trouble. So I'm like your protector. I'm your, I'm your safety net. I'm everything. And without me, you're a mess. And sometimes they'll tell you that. But there is one more. And the last one is they make you doubt your own perspective and desires. In other words, part of controlling people, part of the manipulation technique is that, you know what, they'll tell you, you know what, you don't really like that. You don't really know what you're talking about. You know what, you, 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 and, and they'll, they know more than you about you and what you want. And they'll tell you, and anytime you say, no, that's not, no, 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 I'm right, you're wrong. That's all, those are all controlling techniques. And you say, well, wow, do you think, Pastor, people do that consciously knowing that's what they're doing? No, it just comes with being a controlling person, whether it's a boss, whether it's a wife, whether it's a husband. But listen, I I talk to marriages all the time, and this is what I hear. I hear from the ladies, well, Pastor, you know, my husband is just not the spiritual leader of our home. So there's a guy, I, I look at the guy, and I say, well, so what do you say? She goes, I go, what's up? He says, well, it's true. I, 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 you know, I don't know how to do that. I said, you don't, you don't know how to be the spiritual leader of your home? He goes, I, I don't. You know, I've only been in this a year, two, three, four, five, whatever. You know what, I grew up in it, but I never really have, have paid attention to this. So I say to them, let me give you a couple of ideas of what you can do. I say, well, very simple steps, baby steps. Number one, pray with your family. If you've got little kids, before they go to school, pray with them. You know, at the ta- dinner table, lunch table, breakfast table, say a word of prayer. Well, Pastor, I don't know how to do that. Well, let me put some words in your mouth, you know, something very simple, nothing elaborate. No, you're not going to pray like the pastors. You're not going to pray like someone who used to pray, but very simple. Dear God, you know what? Thank you for my family. Bless my family. Bless my marriage. Watch over us. Lord, thank you for our meal. In Jesus name. Amen. Simple. Start with baby steps. So in a couple of weeks, I'll see them and I'll ask, well, how, how did it go? He comes back. He says, well, you know what? I did what you said, and I tried. And when I finished praying, she said, you call that a prayer? You really think God's going to answer that? You, that was the most mediocre, ridiculous, silly prayer I have ever heard. So you know what your husband's going to do? Why? He's going to get his ball and his bat and his glove, and he's going to say, I'm not going to play this game anymore. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to try again. Because here's what the wife should have done. The wife should have said, honey... 
That was the most amazing prayer. I'm so grateful. I'm so proud of you that you're taking steps. I know they're baby steps, but you know what? I'm so happy. Let's, let's continue to do this. Give him a big old kiss and then promise him something that night. Amen. Can I hear a good amen to that? The reason why I'm saying that is this. What you reward is what's repeated. What you affirm, what you validate, they'll do it again. In other words, he'll risk it again. See, a godly woman will take a weak man and she will make him stronger. A controlling woman will take a weak man and by her words and her belittling and her critical spirit, she'll make him weaker. Let me say this to you women. I don't know a man who has ever crawled out from, from the constant complaining of his wife, a better man. I have watched and seen them. You know what? If they're bad in your eyes, they're worse. Because belittling them doesn't help. But pastor, I'm right. It doesn't have to, anything to do with what you write. It has to do as your role as a help me of making your weak husband a stronger man. And your role, God says, is super important. So watch your words. You know, yeah, sometimes, you know, sometimes you gotta sort of, you know, bite your tongue and say, you know, I, 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 can't, I can't say what I'm thinking. But there's a second thing that she did. Controlling women not only makes a, a, mean, a weak man weaker by, by belittling, but also she takes over, simply takes over. She takes the driver's seat. Notice verse 7. It says, are you the king of Israel or not? Jezebel demanded, get up and eat something and don't worry about it. I'll get you Naboth's vineyard. I got this. You big baby, you loser, you quit so easy, you passive man that lets everybody walk all over you. You don't have the fortitude. You don't have your belt buckled well. You don't got your men pants on. So let me put him on and let me help you. Now, some of the women about this point, you're like, but pastor, that's just the way he is. And if I don't take control and if I don't do it, it's not going to get done. And by the way, I want to acknowledge that. I know that. I know that sometimes if the woman doesn't do it, it's not going to get done. I know that if you depended on him to do what needs, what he's supposed to be doing, you'd be in a mess. But here's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you're constantly stepping into his God-given spot over and over again, eventually he won't do it. Eventually he will never learn to do it. Eventually he'll surrender God's calling upon him as the man of the house. He'll surrender it and he'll say, you got it. You do it. And I'll tell you, sometimes that's necessary. Sometimes I understand. But I'll tell you what I've learned. If you do that, you're going to have less and less respect for your husband because you're seeing the weakness. And you're going to get tired. And it's going to get old. And you're going to not have respect because you're going to always be thinking, when is he going to step up and do what he's supposed to do? So ladies, you have to make a choice. Take a weak man, a godly woman takes a weak man and makes him stronger and helps him out. So you have to make a choice. You know what? Encourage him or continue to put him down. Or you take control. Yeah, uh, you know, they say, well, well, Pastor, my husband doesn't help me with anything at the house. Well, put him to vacuum. Well, I have put him to vacuum. He doesn't know how to vacuum. I mean, I show him and, you know, after it's done, the lines are not straight. The edges are not correct. I'll do it myself. Well, listen, as you teach him, it's going, to, it's going to take him a while to get those lines straight. Can I hear a good amen to that? Amen. You know, don't criticize him. Just say, honey, good job. We do this every other day. God bless you. Amen. <laughs> Whenever you can, every other day. Well, pastor, he doesn't help me wash dishes. The guy says, well, we have a dishwasher. You don't even want to put him in the dishwasher. And when you do, you don't even do it right. So he puts the cups where the plates go. He puts the plates where the cups go. He puts stuff where the spoons go. And you're like, you know what? He doesn't know what he's doing. And then, ladies, I don't understand. You make, him wa- you make us wash him before we put him in the, in the dish. Why do we have to wash him and put him in the dishwasher? You can, you can explain that to me afterwards, all right? All right. But, Pastor, my husband, you know, he, he, he just doesn't do it. And you know what? Our kids, he doesn't discipline the kids. 
And I suggest to you, maybe he's tried, but the last 18 times that he's tried, you've always criticized him and put him down and said, you know what? You're too harsh. You're too mean. You're insensitive. And wives, we are insensitive because we're not women. We're not as in touch with our emotions as you are. We're not in touch with how our words affect other people as much as you are. That's not an excuse. But what happens is you have to sit us down in a nice way without mothering us and say, you know, you were very harsh on him or her. And this is probably how he felt, she felt. Is that, did that accomplish what you wanted to accomplish? Maybe not. Now, I, I got to stop here and I got to, now, I, I, I got to help the ladies out because, you know, there are women that are, they're not really controlling. And, and I say this seriously, they're just, their personality is type A personality. Type A personalities are people who simply like to get things done. They're goal-oriented. You know what? They, something needs to be done. They don't want to wait. And rather than wait, they rather get it done. Something needs to be organized. They're like, you know, and sometimes type A personalities can come off as very controlling. When they're not controlling, they're just, you know what? They're just good. They, they get things done. By the way, those type A personalities are great employees. They're wonderful to have. But when you add type A personality to a controlling person, that's, a, that's out of control. So now, wives, what do you do with the passive guy? Pastor, what, what, what do you recommend? Well, here's what I recommend. Number one, you know what? Pray. Lord, this is my husband. For whatever reason, he's passive. For whatever reason, he's not a take charge, take control. For whatever reason, he doesn't, for whatever reason, the Lord, I want to be the godly woman that takes him and, and helps him because that's my role. Lord, help me to do that. So you pray. And then you get out of the way and you let God do the work that he needs to do. All right? That's the second thing. You pray, then you get out of the way. Let them. All right, it's going to take them 10 times before they learn how to vacuum, before they learn how to cut the yard, before they learn whatever you think they need to learn. Give them 10 opportunities. Give them 20 if they need it. But that's what you have to do. By belittling them, by taking charge and taking control, you're not solving anything. But let me take a few minutes and talk to the men for a, for a minute. You know, perhaps the reason why Jezebel felt like she had to take control is that maybe Ahab gave up too easy, too easily. Maybe he was too passive. Maybe he wasn't a take charge type of guy. By the way, guys, scripture is very clear. In God's perfect world, man is under the authority of Christ. And the woman is under the authority of the man. It's God's word. It's not a power thing. It's not a who's more important, who's more valuable. It's simply God's plan, ordained plan for the family. I want you to know, men, that if that's true, what I just told you, God has hardwired us to lead. If God has given us the responsibilities to be the heads of our homes, that means that in us, there is the ability to lead. It's in you. You don't have to be taught. You simply have to step out and do it. It is a learning. There is a learning curve. There is, it, doesn't just, it doesn't just happen. You have to learn. Well, pastor, someone has to tell me. Yeah, honestly, no one has to tell me, but you might need a mentor or someone that you can bounce things off. But this is the way I look at it. You know, a tiger, you don't have to teach a tiger how to hunt. You don't have to teach a fish how to, how to swim. You know what? It's in them. And I believe that it's in you to lead. To be the man of God, to be the leader, the authority of your family, of your house. You see, because God, God, God says that. Real quick, let me tell you what God's word says. God, God calls men to lead their families in three major important areas. Here's number one. God calls you to be the provider. That doesn't mean your wife can't work. That doesn't mean she's barefoot and pregnant at home all the time. No, no, she can be a, a financial contributor as well. It doesn't mean, you know what, that you are, you do everything or you balance the checkbook or you, no, no, what she's good at, you let her do it, but you are the provider and you lead. And as a provider, you say, you know what, we're a Christian family and you give direction. We're going to honor God. I believe that God blesses our family when we put God first. We're going to pay our tithes. We're going we're gonna to be financially stable. We're going to spend less than what we make. We're going to honor God in all that we do. 
I'm going to make sure as a provider that I, my, I, the gift I'm going to give my family is financial stability. That's my job. That's what God calls. And we honor God when we do that. Here's the second thing. God has called you to be the protector. That doesn't mean somebody breaks in your house. You know what? You get your shotgun and you kill him, even though that might be the case. But it means you protect them. You let them know, I will protect you. I will protect you spiritually, emotionally. You know what? Honey, the children you give me, I'm going to protect my children from the wrong kinds of friends. And when they grow up and they say, well, my friends are doing it. You're as a protector. You're going to say, I'm not, inter- I, I, I'm not responsible for your friends. I'm responsible for you. And as a family that loves God, this is what we do. Me and my, as for me and my family, we're going to serve my house. We're going to serve the Lord. You know what? We're not a family that does what everyone else does. And, and as the protector, you lead them spiritually. That includes your, your spiritual thing. So, and that's the third one. You're, you're the pastor. Well, pastor, I'm not a pastor. You're the pastor. I might be the pastor of the church, but you're the pastor of your family. This doesn't mean you have to have gone to Bible school or, or you're a theologian. What it does mean is that you set the spiritual tone and direction of your family. You know what? Our family honors God. Our family reads the word. Our family prays. Our family is involved in church. Our family goes to church because we honor God in all that we do. You know, we pray every time we eat because we know there's millions of families out there who are without, and God has blessed us and honored us. In other words, you set the spiritual tone for your family. You can do it. God has pre-wired us men as husbands to do it. You got to stand up and tell your family, here's where we're going as a family. And your wife, if she wants to honor God, she will support you. She will back you up. She will come alongside as a helper because she knows that's what God says. Lead your family. As a provider, the protector, and the pastor. By the way, guys, your job is not to make a lot of money or have a bigger house. Because if, if you think that's all your role is, you are missing out on really what God says our role is. I mean, if you can do better and help you provide better, that's good. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is we honor God. So ladies, let me say to you, believe in them. Move out of the way and say, honey, take us, lead us. You can do it. Let me know how I can help. That would be the happiest day in the life of your husband. God would be, I mean, he's going to blow his mind. He's going to look at you and says, uh, take your temperature. Are you okay? I'm way okay. But let me get back before I make the last point. Let me get back to the story. So Jezebel is all about control. So here's what she does. I'm going to get you that vineyard. And the Bible tells us she puts together this elaborate, deceptive, and evil plan. She uses a spiritual excuse. Read it when you get home. She called for a a time of fasting and prayer. And then we're all going to get together and, and end our fast. But she gets a couple of her guys and she tells them, go and get Naboth and bring them. Bring them to the party I'm throwing to end our fast. But I want you to find two thugs and I want you to pay them to accuse Naboth of cursing God and the king. And of course, it's all a lie. Manipulation on her part. She is a controlling woman. She knows he's going to be found guilty. And then she tells him, then take him outside of the city and stone him. And that's exactly what happens. She has him murdered. But you know, it's interesting when you read the story, even though she has him murdered, You know who was responsible and who God holds accountable? Ahaz, Ahab. Ahab is responsible. God doesn't go to Jezebel. He goes to the spiritual head. He goes to the leader of that family, this passive man. And he says, notice what he says. Look at verse 15. When Jezebel heard the news, she said to Ahab, you know, the vineyard Naboth wouldn't sell you. Well, you can have it now. He's dead. So Ahab immediately went down to the vineyard of Naboth to claim it. But the Lord said to Elijah, now Elijah's a prophet, verse 18, go down to meet King Ahab of Israel who rules in Samaria. He will be at Naboth's vineyard in Jezreel claiming it for himself. Give him this message. This is what the Lord says. Wasn't it enough that you killed Naboth? Must you rob him too? 
And because you have done this, dogs will lick your blood at the very place where they licked the blood of Naboth. They stoned him. Blood's all over. The dogs would come. The wild dogs would come and lick the blood. A gory death. But I want you to notice that Naboth technically, that, that, that Ahab technically have Naboth killed? No, it was Jezebel. But listen, gentlemen, this is how important our role is. God goes to him through the prophet and says, you're the one. You're responsible. So guys, step into your leadership role. At the end of the day, you're going to stand before God and you're going to be held accountable. I'm so thankful for women that empower their men to be what God has, has called them to be. And ladies, listen, I pray that God would use you to make a weak man stronger. And gentlemen, husbands, I pray that you would step into and lead your family you know what, where God would want you to lead them. And sometimes they're tough decisions. But we can do it. You have what it takes. Can I hear a good amen to that? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your great love and for your word. Father, those of us that are married, uh, we have quite a challenge. Lord, husband and wives. And Lord, I'm thinking of those that are not married and are listening. Father, I pray that what they're hearing would help them build a foundation for one day when they do meet their soulmate, that they would be better prepared and understand some of the issues. Lord, and would choose a spouse, husband or a wife, that they can serve you and be all that God wants them to be. But Lord, for our marriages today, I pray that you would do a healing and a divine work in a way that only you can. Lord, I know there are a lot of resentful men because of the controlling wives. And I know there's a lot of resentful wives because of their passive men that have sort of put it all on them. And God, regardless of where they're at, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would touch them. I pray, Lord, that you would support, you would encourage, you would uplift. And Father, you would help us, God, to put in practice what we learn from your word. And I pray, Lord, that every man would understand that they're under you. And that because they're under you, their wives will come under them. So, Father, we cannot do it without your help. Lord, we live in an imperfect world. We live in a world full of sin. We live in a world, Lord, that has influenced us and continues to influence us and sometimes contrary to the principles of your word. So empower us, Lord, to listen to you. Give the men the the courage to step up and the women to help their weak men become stronger. And Father, I'm thinking of those that have never given their lives to Christ that are listening. And Father, while what we have said might make sense to them, they miss the most important ingredient and that is to have a relationship with you. So, Father, I pray that if there's anyone here or out there listening, that at this moment they would give their life to you. And, Father, your word is clear. It's it's through a simple prayer of confession where where we say, Lord, I am a sinner. Save me. Forgive me of my sins. I repent of my sins. I turn to you as the only source and answer for my dilemma. I surrender my life to you. Fill me with your spirit. Lord, I have made a mess of my family, of my marriage, of my life, thinking that I knew best. I realize, Lord, I, I don't know best. So come into my life. Thank you for new life. Lord, I give it to you. I thank you that for that, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I believe a lot of people pray that prayer. They've gotten saved, given a new life by the Lord. Would you give them a hand clap? Welcome them to the family of God. Amen. Amen. Before I let you go today, let me first of all say I'm glad you're, you, you're watching or you're here. If you're here, actually, I want you to stand. But I, I want to pray. You know, our kids are back to school, and uh, going back to school has been quite a challenge for parents, for educators, for administrators. As a matter of fact, it is a very contested issue in uh, many states of America, many of our communities. Parents are stressed out. Teachers are stressed out. And the kids are stressed out. So they need our prayer. And as they've gone back to school and some are going back to school this coming week, would you join me in saying a word of prayer for them right now? Let us pray. Father God, there's nothing as precious to us, Lord, as our kids. Lord, you're number one. Our spouse is number two. Our kids come. They're number three. And Father, these have been trying days. 
Lord, as we've tried to make sense of their education. And Father, parents are stressed out because they're home with their kids. Lord, they're their teachers. They're their everything. And Father, it's overwhelming for some. Lord, I, I think of our educators that are fearful. Lord, because of their age, because of their pre-existing conditions, or, or the many reasons we pray, Lord, for your strength and your peace. Lord, for the administrators that need to make all of this happen. The technical part, the communication part. Father, it's a big task. But Father, we're concerned about our kids. We commit them to you. Lord, we commit to them, to you, their education. Father, we don't relegate. We have the responsibility, always have, Lord, of not only teaching them spiritually, but Lord, also in all areas that we can. We're learning, Lord, there is this pandemic that God, uh, thank you for teachers and thank you for those that have stepped in to help us. But at the end of the day, it's our responsibility. We commit them to you. I commit to you the parents. Some are here today. They're overwhelmed, Lord. I ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.